So the last time I was here, we began speaking about how God speaks to us today. It is a very important subject and topic because the reality of the matter is all of us at some point or the other wants to know how can we commune with God or how does he speak to us? Like, you know, I don't want to figure out what's my purpose, what's my why, I need to make a decision. And sometimes, especially when you're going through pain, uh, we wonder where is God, like he's silent. But the last time, as, as an introduction, I mentioned at least 12 ways in which God speaks to us. So let's do a little recap together here. You're not in school, but hey, it's, this is, it, this is a, a place where we can come and learn to, right? So anybody remembers, what are some of the ways in which God speaks to us? There were 12 ways. So let me get uh, uh, at least half of that, six. Through his word, numero uno, uh-huh, one. Dreams, other people, the Holy Spirit, hallelujah for that, uh-huh. Nature, right, is creation. Anything else? Uh, friends, other people, all right? So we have, that's six, we did, we, did, we did get half. Wonderful, you, you did well, wonderful class. Um, and then the first message based on that, we talked about deception, because though God speaks to us, and though he has multitude, by the way, 12 is not just limited, right? We say, the scripture reading reminds us from Hebrews chapter 1, God who at various times and in various ways have spoken to us. So God uses many different ways to speak to us. But the reality is we want to be very careful because though he speaks, Pastor Duncan, the devil is also a deceiver. And he wants to counterfeit Every way in which God speaks to so you and I, we can become confused, and hence, we will be lost, right? We just got off of a, a quarterly lesson speaking about the end of time, but remember, when the disciples asked Jesus to tell them when this is going to happen, Jesus, first of all, said, listen, take heed that no man deceives you. Right there in Matthew chapter 24, in three places, he told them to be careful, because he says, Many false prophets, many false Christs. Now, now we, we, we discount that. He says many false prophets and many false Christs will arise, and they will also deceive many. Many means many. Sometimes, actually, it's the, the majority, therefore, is not always right. Matthew chapter 7, he says, Jesus talks about the broad way and, the, and how many people on the narrow way. Few. How many are on the Broadway? Many. Maybe among those many are some of those people who will be deceived, as what Jesus mentioned. And part of that, which we're going to study today, is the reality in 21 to 24. He says, many also will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not done X, Y, and Z? And he will say what? Depart from me. I never knew you. You are the ones who work iniquity. So, Number two, today's topic we're going to talk about is Jesus, prophets, and the word. And then the final wrap-up, we're going to talk about signs and wonders, visions, and dreams. But I have a quick video for us to watch, and I want you to think about what you are hearing in this video, because we can kind of minimize the impact. Listen, this message is so crucial because your eternal significance, your eternal well-being, rather, lies in the balance. If, if Jesus has predicted, because Jesus is also, as it were, a prophet, Jesus is given a prophecy saying, many will be deceived. Not if and but, but many will be deceived. And how are we being deceived? We have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. And that's why I'm bringing this to you, because I don't want anyone to be deceived. Amen? Amen. Ever since the creation of the world and the fall of man, God has graciously spoken to sinful humans through chosen messengers called prophets. Through Noah, he warned the world of a coming flood. To Moses, he gave the Ten Commandments. Through Daniel, he predicted future events. Through John the Baptist, he pointed sinners to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. What about right before Jesus returns? Will God speak again in these end times? The Bible predicts, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. You, you have a very strong belief that you are a prophet. Yes, sir. And you believe that that's not true. Correct. You believe that's not true. Correct. Tell me how you learned that you were anointed. It really just started um, when I started asking the Lord what my purpose was because we all have one. And so um, I really just ended up being pointed a lot to the books of the prophets in the Bible. And, you know, as I was asking, I could see a lot of ways that I could identify. It wasn't like one moment where the no. clouds opened, you, no. you heard the baritone voice. There, no. there wasn't one of those no. Well, this just kind of came on you through your reading and studying. Right. All right. And so upon what do you base y y your opinion that this is just not true? I believe there's a balance in everything you do. <clears throat> and when you can't talk to somebody without them quoting scriptures at you and and telling you that you can raise a frog from the dead? Are you seeing them try to raise a chicken that's, like I said, flat as a pancake, that's been dead for days, and out there praying in the rain for that chicken, trying to bring it back? Like my husband said, don't waste your time and energy on a dead chicken. Go down to the morgue and raise them up. I just want to clarify. I don't believe in this moment that I can raise the dead. I know that I have witnessed the frog, but it's hard for me because it's still something I'm learning. I believe in um, the principle of parsimony. I mean, right. what's most likely? What's the simplest explanation? In science, it's referred to as Occam's razor. Now, if you say, I raised a frog from the dead, um, you know, is that the simplest explanation? Or would a simpler explanation be the frog was stunned? If you take a frog that's flat and pressed in between two two-by-fours... He's not just done. I'm just saying, do you test your reality to say, has God anointed me to resurrect this frog or this dead chicken? I mean, you don't seem happy. I'm not happy because I have been experiencing so many things the last couple of years on my own um, spiritually. And I've never been, I don't go to church. I don't know the Bible. I don't know all this stuff. My husband does. And so I go to him, and I try to have somebody, because I've never really had anyone to talk to. Okay. I, okay. Well, you've changed. You, you I, recognize I, something has changed. Oh, I know for a fact I've changed, yes. Okay. And what do you attribute the change to? God and Jesus and myself. Okay. And, and God and Jesus changed you in what way? They've come inside you? You... What, what's your connection to God and Jesus that, uh, that happened within the last two years? At first, I thought it was basically um, just my own voices, um, my own mind. But my mind is not this smart. So all of a sudden, I start hearing these things, and I've actually allowed them to take over my body. I've actually allowed them. I've surrendered to them. How do you know it's God talking to you? I, I've learned to know if it's God, if it's Jesus, if it's the Holy Spirit, if it's my grandmother, people that have passed recently, I know when they're there. And you say that you have visions. I wouldn't say visions. You did say visions. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I wouldn't say, okay, so no visions. Sorry about that. I just, I just hear things. I just hear things well, that I you said you I have visions of, of God and angels and that you hear a voice in, in your head. I think in one of the tapes that we heard early on, you were saying that you were God. God has entered my body, yes, and he, he has done it several times because I've allowed him to. I've said, take whatever I've got. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. 
God speaks through Jesus. Now, there's no doubt that today we have an explosion in the psychic phenomena. There's no doubt today that people are interested in communing with the divine, the higher power, the universe, whatever they may call it. Actually, if you can dim it like that, I can see a little bit better uh, the way you had it just before that. Um, and, and so this is the reality. And these are people who are, again, as you saw, they're appearing on televisions, and uh, the lady is saying, I don't, know, I don't go to church, I don't know the Bible, but I'm sure that this is God, I'm sure that this is Jesus that is entering my body. And the previous lady is saying that, yes, I can resurrect a frog. Now, that's, those are the kind of things that we have to be careful. If you don't know the scripture, even those experiences, they could be true. But does that confirm spiritually and biblically that this person is a prophet of God? Do you see what I'm saying? Because, yes, even if right now she raised up a whole bunch of animals, does that confirm it's God's will? You see, because the devil is giving people a lot of experiences that are genuine, all right? But the reality is, again, when we go back to Scripture and you compare the two, you will realize, where did God raise up a frog in the Bible? Where did God raise up an animal? Where did he give you a message that, that this next movie star is going to marry so-and-so? These are the kind of stuff that people today are saying they are prophets, and they're predicting who's going to be, the, you know, who Angela, Angelina Jolie is going to marry next, and all of this kind of stuff, and the horoscopes. And, but when you look at Bible, when you compare what God revealed to his servants, it has nothing to do with those type of things. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So this is the reality of today that many people are self-proclaimed, and the reality is even in the Bible. We saw that God spoke to this person, and they went out proclaiming. Today, I am a prophet. Like, did God even speak to you? Did God commission you? Did God, how, how, how do you just take that title on on yourself? And so I want you guys to be careful because this is the way multitude of people are being deceived. Not only that, but again, we assume today, because you're on television, because TV is a form of authority. If you're on TV, you got a whole lot of views on YouTube, people just assume that it is true. This many people can't be wrong. I beg to differ. Most of the times, the majority are wrong. Not always right. The majority are generally wrong. So what do we do? God does speak. It's no, there's no doubt. And he uses prophets. There's no doubt. Because he's saying there are counterfeit. Therefore, of course, there has to be the genuine. Right? God speaks to us through nature. We went through all these things. He speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. He speaks to us through Jesus. He speaks to us through providence. He speaks to us through dreams and visions and angels and the like. So if a person says, I've seen an angel, okay, what, the, what was the message? I'm not doubting that you saw an angel. But if the angel contradict the scripture, Paul says that even if one came down from heaven and they bring to you some of the gospel, it's best that they were cursed. So we have to be very careful. Last time again, we quoted from the book Great Controversy. In the last days, so close will the counterfeit resemble the original that the only way we will be able to discern and know what is the difference is by the scriptures. So prophets, are they of God? Of course, we cannot deny that. But do we find them in the magazines? Do we find them in the best-selling books out there making multitude of millions of dollars? Right? You have Christians even today because we are so desperate to know the Lord's will and we think that God is not speaking to us, we go to get spiritual readings. Right? Call up Chloe, let Chloe tell you what your future is. Right? Call up the psychic hotline. You see, a lot of people are doing these things today and they think that it is an innocent thing. But I want to remind you that in the Bible, in the scriptures, God actually says, when you read especially Deuteronomy, I think I have a slide coming up, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, those who practice and do such things, it says these are an abomination to the Lord. Do you know what an abomination is? Very detestable, disgusting, stuff that makes you want to throw up. But today, again, remember, tolerance, let's, it's, it's all good. Whatever you want to do is fine. Yes, your eternal life is in the balance, and it's up to you. So what about modern prophets? Do we have modern prophets today? 
Or should we just do away with all prophets? Well, let's go back to the scripture. The Bible says, Amos chapter 3, verse 7, 1, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto whom, everybody? And notice, his servants. So prophets are servants of God. So God says before he takes action on many things, he will reveal his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So we can see, therefore, that prophets are valid and necessary. Not only that, in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20, one of the uh, verses I like, it says also here, what? Believe in the Lord your God so you will be established or made firm. Believe in his prophets. So if we disbelieve in his prophets, we may not prosper. Or we may not succeed. This is what, remember, we talked about success earlier. So, in other words, God is saying that if he gives indeed a message to prophets and we disbelieve the prophets, we are disbelieving God. Are you there? Some of us today have contempt even for prophets, but the reality is if indeed God spoke through a prophet and gave a prophet a message and you disbelieve the message, you are disbelieving God. That's what, that's what Jeremiah and others have said in the scripture, even Moses. They have not rejected you. God said, no, they are rejecting me because it's his word through the prophet. What else do we have? Even in the New Testament, because some people, again, Old Testament. That's all, all Old Testament. So God used the prophets in the past. Remember our scripture reading says, God, who at sundry times or in various ways, has spoken to our fathers through the prophets. So most people take that and say, now, that's only in the Old Testament, that God only used prophets in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, there is no need for prophets. Well, somebody didn't read their scriptures, because the Bible tells us, again, in Corinthians here, 1 Corinthians 14, 22, Prophesying is not for whom? Unbelievers. But who is prophecy for? For the church. So a church who does not have prophecy or understand prophecy is a blind church. Why? Because as you will notice, the Bible says also here that, you see, prophecy never came by the will of men. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by whom? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes from? God. So therefore, the reality is, when we have prophetic insight, these are the words of God. And so the words of God are for us to believe and to follow. Furthermore, the Bible says, God had set some in the church, first apostles, and secondarily whom? Prophets. Now, we call these what? Spiritual gifts. Who gave the spiritual gifts? Who gave the spiritual gifts? Through whom? Through Christ. Because the Bible says when Christ died, he ascended up on heaven and he gave what? Gifts unto men. So Jesus Christ gave the gifts of prophecy and prophets to his church, not to the world. So that's why we're not interested in who is going to marry Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt and so forth. We're not interested in those things. God is not necessarily giving out those advice, though he can, but come on. Is, God, is your eternal life, is that important to your salvation? Whether or not the, the, the next person and, and what you're going to do. And I know these things are important. We want to know some of this stuff. But again, when you look at what the prophets did in the Bible, it does not mirror a whole lot of what we see today or even what some of us try to do. Because we say we want to know God's will and who I should marry and who I should not marry. Those things are important. We can find principles in the Bible. But yet God is not so much so all coming down to say, you should marry brother so, you should marry sister so. He says, I've given you principles. Here's all my children. If you follow the guidelines, first of all, you marry in the faith. Second of all, they must love Jesus. Right? If you have those basic things lined up, then it's according to your will and your desire. But God is not necessarily saying, well, you must go with this one and you must go with that one. No, he can't do that. But the reality is most of the time he doesn't because he gives you the desires of your heart. God gives principle. There are many things is not just clear cut in the Bible like this. But you follow the principles and then you'll be able to get the results that God has given. Are we there? I know sometimes that trips us up, right? God, should I wear blue shoes or blue tie today? Come on. Is that important? Yeah, but it's not really, you know, you don't need to follow the scripture. He says, look decent. That's a principle. So you come to church looking decent, but he's not interested in if you're looking like Pastor Duncan at a million dollars today. He's not interested in, in if you're that. He's interested in you look good. So that's what Pastor Duncan today, he said, he didn't have to go, I hope you didn't, you kneel down and say, Lord, should I wear the blue or the white or the black? No, he said, I want to look good today, and so I'm going to present myself to God. That's principle. Are we there? So 
be careful because many of us, that's why we end up becoming desperate because we say, God is not speaking because he has not revealed to me which school I should go to or which thing I should do. Listen, listen, you're going to be waiting a whole long time if you want to hear from God for some of these things. The reality is God speaks primarily in the scripture for eternal things, things of significance. These are significant to you as a human being, yes, but the reality is you have to seek him and follow his guidelines, his principles. If you are genuinely in line with the principles of God, go forward. Don't always be checking, see if you're right or wrong. No, you're not breaking the laws of God. You're following his guidelines. You say, hey, God, based on what I see you're saying here, I'm going forward. Even the spirit of prophecy says sometimes long delay ties the angels because God is waiting on us to make a decision, and we're trying to throw it back on him. No, God is saying, listen, I've given you my words, so go forward. And be who I call you to be. What career should I pick? Well, God has gifted you with, with talents and spiritual gifts. So in other words, he might not necessarily say become a doctor. Or he might not be, be saying become an engineer. But what he's saying is, the way I've gifted you and the desires in your heart, you pick a career that matches. And if you pick a career that matches your gifts and talents, then you're in the will of God. And if you're serving his children, you're in the will of God. If you don't like it, later on, God is saying, I'll give you the desires of your heart. So what do you desire? Lord, I want a different job. Okay, find another one that matches your gifts and talents and, and so forth. And you follow God's principles. You're not going to steal. You're not going to rob. And if you're not doing those things, then God is well pleased with that. And you keep going forward. Not only that, another place again, Ephesians chapter 4, is again, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, why? Because this is for the church. He says this is for the edification of the church till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of God. So in other words, God is saying, I'm giving you these gifts, including prophecy, so the church will not come behind, so the church, you will not be tossed. Another verse, verse right after this, 14 says, we will not be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. This is what is happening to even Adventists today. We are chasing behind all these phenomena. We are chasing behind this one and that one. And we are not going back to our prophetic roots. God has given you the key and the ability to understand prophecy. And not only that, but to understand what you see happening in the world today. But we have to check it in accordance with the word. This is not Old Testament. This is New Testament. I want to throw something out here as well. We know this verse. In the Revelation, that's the last book of the Bible, we see prophecy again. Who gave, the, who, gave, who gave the insights to John? Who spoke to John in the Revelation primarily? This is a message that comes from whom? From whom? Jesus, right? Are we there? It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a message that came from God, John says, that he wants to show us, Martha, what shall sh uh, shortly come to pass. So this is a message from John. John once asked the, the I mean, when John was taken up in vision, he wanted to worship the, the angel. And the angel said, no, I am your fellow servants, our prophet servants of God. Yes, they are. So the angel is saying, I am, of your, I am one of your fellow servants and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. And what is the testimony of Jesus? The spirit of prophecy. So in other words, here are some points. The brethren of John are the prophets. The brethren have the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is in God's life, the remnant church. So therefore, if you are an Adventist today, therefore, you should not be despising prophecy and prophets. Why is that? Because I'll share with you as we conclude, if you do, you might be missing out on what God is saying. Not only that, but you can also be in an eternal uh, quagmire, as it were. Let's continue. Are all prophets in the Bible? I mean, not all God's prophets are in the Bible. This is important. You know why? Because some of us, if we're not careful, remember, in the last days, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus and this primarily. All right? Num numero uno. Keep your eyes on Jesus and the Word of God. Because, again, there are two extremes. There are two things I want us to be careful of, Sister Smith. One is that we do not reject whom God may be using. And the other side is that we're not just so open to any and everything. Are we there? Because sometimes we can be so cautious that we now label God's movement as something demonic. So let us be careful on, that we're not on both extremes. We've got to know the word. Because here's the reality. Some people say, because they're not in the Bible or they're not Bible writers, we're not going to accept them. This is a problem. 
This is a problem. Here's a scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer, for he who is now called a prophet was formerly called what? A seer. In other words, you type that word into your Bible software, and not, not only that, but let me ask you, where is the book of Gad? Where is the book of Heman? Right? I think somebody read it today for scripture reading that God spoke to the prophet Gad. But we don't have his book today, do we? Can you think of anyone, anyone else? We don't have his book today. Does that mean he wasn't the prophet of God? Not only that, have you ever read in the Bible that there was a school of the prophets? Elijah taught at the school of the prophets, plural. Now, what does a school have at the Well, we don't know back then, but I'm saying normally at the end of every year you have graduation. If there was a school of the prophets, I'm sure there were prophets graduating from the school. And we don't know who they are or how many there were. Are we there? So the reality is just to say because somebody is not in the, I mean, doesn't have a, a Bible, per se, uh, um, um, like a book or a chapter or anything like that written, it does not necessarily mean that they were not used. And even if we discover their writings today, you might say, well, because it's not part of the Bible, we're not going to accept it. No. That is a, that is, that is, that is a false um, a way, a false stance to take because the reality is God spoke to this person. Not just because it's not in the Bible, it doesn't mean it's not accepted, all right? Are we, are we clear on that? Does that make sense? Now, let me ask you another question. Do you know any other prophets that were in the Bible that, are not, that we don't have a book for? Any others you can think about? Nathan, there you go. And Nathan was a big-time prophet. And we don't have a book for him, but we have some, you know, we have some narrative concerning Eli. The mightiest man, the, I mean, Elijah was one of the, you know, today young folk would say he was one of the baddest prophets in the Old Testament. And, but he's not there. He, I mean, where's his book? Somebody else wrote about his actions. Right? Maybe they said, well, he was taken to heaven, so therefore we, we don't have a book for him. Well, you know, the reality is God can use whom he wants to use. Moses. Now, Moses wrote a whole lot of you know, the first five books of the Bible and so forth. But here's the thing. Interestingly, Moses didn't really talk about himself that much. He gave some, um, some, some, you know, some narratives and so forth. We saw him in the action. But it was not, nothing about, that's another key thing about how you can discern whether someone is from God or not. How about women? Now, this one kind of jumped forward. Women. Do you realize that there were at least eight women in the Bible who were prophets? Not just in the Old Testament, but New Testament as well. There were actually more mentioned in the New Testament. So here we have Miriam. Miriam was Moses' sister. Not only that, but Aaron. Aaron was both prophet and a priest. Moses was a prophet and a priest. Are we there? Deborah, Huldah, Anna in the New Testament. And not only that, but the, the Bible tells us that there were four virgin daughters of Philip the Evangelist. Four of them, and they were all prophets. Those are at least eight women in the Bible who were prophets. Where are their books? but they spoke for God. And this is also New Testament. So again, this is important because I think many people today, they don't, you know, they say, well, once the New Testament came, we don't need prophets anymore. Read the scriptures. Again, that's why I tell you guys, you got to read your Bible. Forget what people say, even on TV. If they don't speak according to the word, forget what their, their word is not important. Here's another one. Let's go forward here. And in those days, Acts 11, in those days came prophets. Plural, from Jerusalem to Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus. There's no book of Agabus. And he signified by the Spirit, because the Spirit was moving heavily in the book of Acts, that there should be a great drought in what? In all the world. Now, here's the interesting thing. This is what? New Testament. This is in the Acts of the Apostles. So even in the New Testament church, the early church, there was prophets. There were prophecies given. To what? To help the church. To help the church, not just one prophet. Because here it says, Agabus was among the prophets. We don't have the rest of their names. And there's, there's other places as well that talks about this. For I say unto you, among these that there were uh, born of women, there was no greater prophet than whom? 
Imagine John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Where's the book of John the Baptist? Is there a book for John the Baptist? Well, there's stuff written about him, but the Bible calls John a prophet. Are we aware of that? John the Baptist is a prophet. And that's why we also listen to his testimony, because when the scripture said he testified of Jesus, we take his testimony, because God was using him. Now, how can we tell? Now, this is where the crescendo happens now. How can we tell the difference between the true and the false, the genuine and the counterfeit? First thing, again, Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and false prophets will arise, and they will show great signs and wonders to deceive, even if possible, God's elect. So do not discount prophets because they are false prophets. Just because they are false doesn't mean all prophets are false. Are we there? Make sure we are clear on that. Next one. 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but do what? Test the spirit. That's why we are here today. That's why I want to give you this stuff. Because in the last days, if we don't test the spirit to know if it's from God or the devil, most likely we will be deceived. Why? Because the devil knows this stuff well. So the reality is if you don't have the scriptures as a guideline, you don't have the spirit of God, what can happen is most likely you will be deceived. Because at the end of the day, we know already the majority of the world will be deceived. So he says, test the spirits. Not only that, another guideline, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, one that we know very well. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. Now, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to be anything. But when I saw those two clips from Dr. Phil, I will leave you to make your own analysis, but I would say based on what the scripture says, both of them were false. Both of those women were false prophets, period. They sound close, especially the first one, right? But you're there trying to raise frogs to prove that you're a prophet of God, I mean, there's so, much, so many things to do, but you want to practice on raising a frog to life. Those are the kind of stuff that makes Christians look cuckoo. That's why people sometimes like, I can't stand these Christians, because y'all, y'all, y'all are way over there doing some crazy nonsense. And the reality is, no, there is a way. You can test the difference between the true and the false. And sometimes, again, we say, oh, don't judge. Brothers, let me tell you what, this scripture is not, the Bible says we can judge all things. Right? Judging to the sense of condemning people. But he says, by your fruit you shall know them. So of course I have to judge between right and wrong. Didn't he tell us to judge between right and wrong? If you're doing wrong, I can say it's wrong. Don't judge me. You judge yourself. By your fruits, we shall know them. So therefore, you act like it, look like it, talk like it. Therefore, you are it. I didn't call you that. You called yourself that. Based on your actions and your words. So, Jesus calls some people false prophets. But we would say, no, that's so mean. Oh, be a better Christian than that. How are you going to call them false prophets today? Everything goes in your world, in the world of God, in the kingdom of God. Is his way or in my brothers? He said there are many ways that leads to destruction. This is God's way. To the law to the testimony of God, the Spirit, if it's not here, my brothers and sisters, we better be very careful before you accept that. Not only that, he says also in Numbers chapter 12, 6 and 8, and he said, hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him, how? In a vision, and will speak to him in a dream, or even face to face. Now, we're going to leave that one for the third message. So, I'm going to, but still, we know that God, this is one of the ways he reveals himself. But even then, he gives some, you know, some, some, some principles. Because even though he speaks in a vision and through a dream, he says, if the thing that the prophet says does not come to pass, you surely know that they are false prophets. All right? So that's one of the key things. So again, our dreams and visions, yes. Does God speak through this way? Yes, he does, John. But the reality is, he says, even with that, he says, if the thing does not come to pass, that's a false prophet. Are we there, my brothers and sisters? Here are some other principles. They must have prophetic accuracy, right, basically basically if it comes to pass. They must be faithful to the word of God. In other words, it's not contradictory to the scriptures. They must also exhort Jesus. When you read, (laughs) 
can't believe some folks, we actually read some of this stuff, right? When you read the horoscopes and you read uh, Nostradamus and all this stuff, that, that is not elevating Jesus. It's always some flamboyant, crazy stuff, sensational stuff. And you know why these things sell? Because these are hot magazines. They sell because they know. Marketers know what people love and what they're interested in, so they give you more of the same. Sensational stuff. They must be keeping the commandments of God. Why is that? Revelation tells us, right? In the last days, they keep the commandments of God. They have the faith of Jesus. They have the testimony of the Spirit. And so, therefore, the reality is we must be able to look at those things. One of the most important ones also is this, spiritual fruitage, meaning, again, by their fruits, you shall know them. This is how you measure if it's true or not. And there goes a whole bunch of scriptures. You can take um, a photo of it. Next, the prophet must be speaking for God. It must reveal God's purposes. I prophesy again that the next president is going to be so-and-so. Praise God, that might be good insight. You might know something, but the reality is, you know, is it revealing God's purpose? Yeah, he puts up one, he puts six down another. But the reality is, that's not really the order of what you're seeing in the Scripture. I prophesy, and because that's what it is. You know, I don't want to mention this. My, my family sometimes watch the sermon, but, you know, I got, <laughs> I got one relative. And, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and she, she's big into that stuff, you know. Prophets and so-and-so, you know, bishops so-and-so declare over me. And they, they, that's how they come. You know, the prophet will come or the bishop, and they put their hands and say, I declare, I decree and declare that you will be so-and-so. Or God has a great ministry for you, a great mission for you. And so, therefore, they take all of that hook, line, and sinker. And I'm like, okay, it sounds good. But even back then when you got this prophecy, I don't see you starting no ministry. I don't see, even that, that is so genuine that anybody can say that. Joel can get up and say, Daddy, I think you're going to be this. I think you're going to be able to do that. It's so vague, and that's what the horoscopes are. Think about it. Most of the horoscopes is just vague. You're going to have a nice day today. Come on, man. Even the weatherman, the, the media man can figure that out. You look at the sunshine today, you look at the five-day forecast, it's going to be a great day today. I think you're going to do great things in the future. Come on, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. Is it encouraging people to faithfulness, to follow God? So if a prophet now says, you need to go and don't keep God's Sabbath, don't keep his commandment like those Adventist people over there, you can be certain what? That's against the scripture. Follow me? And a whole lot of them will be telling you that. Another good way that's not up there, that ought to be up there is when they say, I'm going to give you a prophecy. Let me get your visa, your MasterCard, your American Express. See? That's, a, that's another big thing on the television. Before, because when, when they go to the palm readers, those are businesses, by the way. They, re, they, they register with the Better Business Bureau. Right? So you go to the palm reader, and the palm reader says, before I give you this reading, let me have your credit card, let me have the check, before I give you the prophecy. Come on. Come on. Next time, but I'm not saying you shouldn't go at all. You shouldn't go. Young people don't go. But if you do go, and they say, where's the credit card? Say, you're a prophet. You ought to know. <laughs> you don't need my credit card. You're a prophet. Figure it out. Just run it. Just swipe it. Let God tell you that. God didn't reveal to you what my credit card is. Are miracles a definitive guide or a, a, an evidence that this someone is a prophet? What do you say? The Bible says here that even those who do signs and wonders will deceive many. Second Thessalonians, that even those Wicked, evil, angels, and demons, they have signs, wonders, and lying wonders. Revelation again, great wonders. They're deceived by their miracles, Revelation 13, right? Talking about the beast and so forth. they deceive by the miracles. Revelation 19, again, these are the last books, my friend. They wrought miracles, which what? Deceive. So miracles, by the way, is miracle a gift of the Spirit in the New Testament church? Yes, brothers, don't be ashamed. Like I said, I, I'm telling you, sometimes we are, so, we are overly cautious. My brothers and sisters, Jesus has declared that there are over 32, 34 spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament. You read Ephesians, you read uh, Corinthians. There are many gifts of the Spirit. But again, because we don't see many of them manifested today, we say, oh, no, they're no longer valid. <laughs> yes, they are. Jesus even said, this is what's going to happen when you follow me. 
You're going to do great things. You're going to do healing and all of those things. So yes, we can expect those things to be happening. And yes, we will be performing those things. But again, what is the end result? What is the purpose? What's the long-term effect of it? Is it exalting Christ or is it exalting the people? Because again, this is another thing I don't get with some of these things on TV. Come to my big rally so we can do a healing and there are people in the hospital that need a healing. You follow me? And they give vague things on television. You have millions of people watching you on TV. And the best that you can come up with is somebody out there has back pain. You're listening to me. How many people have back pain? Almost everybody has back pain. And you're there sitting down. Oh, he's talking to me. He's talking to me. So sow your seed. Plant your seed. Get my healing oil. I got to do all of that just to get a healing? Send you $1,000 and plant a $1,000 seed, and then you send me this. I'm telling you, they, they send you some crazy stuff. Tell you, I grew up as a Baptist. I've seen most of them, you know. And in my early days, too, growing up, you, you, used, to, you, used, to, you know, used to be big in it. I remember ordering some stuff from, uh, what's his name? Kenneth, not Kenneth Copeland. There was another one there. Robert Tilton. Robert Tilton. Yes, Brother Tilton. We're going to say it right here. So, and he sent you. These two palms that are printed out, like kids' thing, you know what I mean? You print out the palms that you can, and he sends you that in the mail. And he sends a little bit of oil, <laughs> and he says, anoint your wallet. <laughs> anoint your wallet, because God has great blessings in store. And I'm saying back then, the, the, the ignorance in you doing these things, right? So I'm putting my hands on the little thing, and take out the little oil, and you, you rub your wallet. My brothers, ain't nothing happened with the wallet. But every month, Tilton was getting that check. Every month. And that's why I say, praise God for discovering the truth. It will surely set you free. Now I realize, I said, boy, these guys have a great job. Can you imagine making millions of dollars just doing this foolish nonsense? And people taking it? This is what I'm saying. People, it's not their fault. It's our fault. Because we see them on TV and we're not reading our scriptures for ourselves and you are falling for these nonsense. Where in the Bible has this stuff ever happened? Where in the Bible the prophet ever says foolish things like that? No, my friends. Now, God can give you some ridiculous instructions. But I'm telling you, he don't, he don't bypass our reasoning capacity. He doesn't bypass your reasoning capacity. Because now, that goes against what? His words in the book of Proverbs. If you want to be hasty to be rich, he said, that's a problem. If you want to gain riches by doing schemes, that's not, you see? But what, what are we trying to do? Get rich quick. So therefore, rub your wallet. Listen, that's against God's word. You're not doing anything. You're not working for nothing. See, that's a, you can just discern. So now, with that, that's what I'm saying. It's not like God, no, that's principles. That's what we're saying. That's not God's principles of how you acquire wealth. That's foolishness. And how many people every month, these grannies too, sending in their retirement check for them to be blessed and to receive some healing. And notice, you can only get the healing if you come to the rally. See what, what's going on? You can only get the healing if you come to the rally. I better not see any of you there. <laughs> and if you see the pastor chance there, you better see something too. I'm telling you. Because some of these preachers, these pastors too, they be doing it in the closet. They might not let you see them up front, but I'm telling you. So you better be careful. That's why I say in the last days, stick to your Bible and stick to Jesus Christ. You stick to Jesus. Because if you see the pastor over there sitting down with Benny Hinn and doing his thing, and you say, Pastor Chance, I love you, but I better not see you back in front of All Nations Church next Sabbath. Amen? No, you better be able to say. Because the problem is we're too close sometimes. We don't want to rebuke. That's what a prophet did in the past. The prophet was said, King, thou art the man. You are in sin. Nathan the prophet, David, you're a sinner, man. This is what you did. Got to be able to call it out. False prophet in the pulpit, call them out, even if it's your pastor. Call them out. Why? Because why allow this person to deceive many? All of our eternal, and not only that, but you might just save their soul as well. You might save my soul. Because those who repent from the error of their ways, the Bible said, there we go, they can change. 
But don't allow stuff to be said from the pulpit because they're being said from the pulpit. They're not all right either. You must test them by the word of God. Let's speed up here a little bit. Now, what about some of the things that we shouldn't do? Write these down. Take a picture of it. Can't go through all of them. Soothsayers, astrologers, sorcerers, those who contact the dead and their movies. That's why I tell you, even the movies, we see these things happening right in front of us and we, you know, uh, it's, we laugh about it. Yeah, you keep laughing about it. This is a, how the devil desensitizes you and then you end up doing this stuff or accepting it into your home and you don't even realize what's going on. Mediums, those who claim to channel the spirits of the dead. Macromancy and the whole like. Witchcraft. But pastor, there's some good witches and bad witches. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Good witch, bad witch. Good witchcraft, bad witchcraft. Good magic, bad witch. Be very careful. Be very careful. Oh, but the, you know, I don't know the cartoon name, but they have some of these cartoon ones. But oh, they're so nice. and You better be careful with that. All right? One who interprets um, omens or cast spells. All right? Where my brother's at? Now, that's not only in, in Haiti and Africa, by the way, it's everywhere, right? But doing this voodoo stuff. That's against God's word. It's against God's word. I don't care who's doing it. Friend or no friend, black or white, it's wrong. You shouldn't be engaged in that. You are encouraging evil presence in your home. And yes, this is the thing, brothers and sisters, don't get me wrong. People get results from this stuff. All right? Because sometimes we dismiss it. Oh, that's just hocus pocus business. No, they're getting results. That's why it's also demonic. They wouldn't be deceived if, if, if they weren't getting results. Think about it. Because he said they're performing miracles and signs and wonders. So therefore, these things are happening. And we don't get that because, again, some of us, we, we, you know, we don't, we, we don't want to see anything beyond if it's not written there in John 3.16. Brothers and sisters, there's a whole lot going on in our world. And you better know. You better learn. Don't go out there seeking all forms of knowledge, but, hey, you better learn. Read stuff and analyze what's going on, okay? Now, Jesus, we go back to as we land the plane. Our main text is Hebrews chapter 1 for all of this. Hebrews 1 declares, God, who at sundry times or various times and in various ways, has spoken to our fathers through the prophets. But that does not mean, my brothers and sisters, that God is done with prophets because he now speaks through Jesus Christ. This is what he's really trying to say. When you continue reading what goes on in the scriptures, as you jot down to verse number four, let's go there. If you have your Bible, it's on the screen, but let's, let, let's, let's open it here. Hebrews chapter one. Verse number two. God has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed to be heir of all things, through whom he has what? Made the world. Verse number three. Who be in the brightness of his glory. The brightness of whose glory? The brightness of the glory of God the Father and the express image of his person. The express image of whom? Of God the Father. And upholding all things by the world with his power. When he had himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of, of the uh, majesty on high. Verse number four. And having become much uh, better than angels... And as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Here's what is happening here in the Bible. When you go over to chapter 3, you will also realize it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostles and the high priests of our confession, Jesus Christ, who is faithful to him who appointed him as what? Moses was faithful in his house. As you jump down verse 5, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, as a prophet, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son, do you see the difference here? Moses was a servant. As a servant, he was faithful. But Christ as a son, the owner of the house, is even more faithful. The Bible says in, um, in John chapter 1, when we look at there, go to John chapter 1 real quick. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 1 tells us something interesting. Now, we know, of course, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was the God, and the Word was God, and so forth, and whatnot, and that is true. And who is that speaking of, by the way? Jesus Christ. Isn't it so? Right? That's what's speaking about Jesus Christ. When you jot down now to verse number 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld what? His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 17, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through whom? Jesus Christ. What this is saying is the message, Brother Hector, that came through the prophets was good. The message that God gave through the prophets were wonderful. The message that God gave through the prophets were inspired. All scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. It's proper for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. The gospel that was preached through them was great, but it was still not in its full fullness. Why? Because the people could not fully understand. So God decides that, yes, the way he wants to speak to us now is to Jesus Christ because Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophets were trying to say. See, this is the reality. It's like reading a book and you're trying to understand what the author had in mind. And you might try to figure it out. You might read my book and you're trying to figure out what is he saying, what is he saying. And so you will have to try to do what? Interpret it in your own way. But if I held a seminar and I say, I'm going to read to you my book, now you can get it straight from the source. You see, everybody in the Bible were trying to figure out who God is. And so God was shrouded in mystery in many ways. So yes, he spoke through different things, different ways, through different stuff. But the reality is sometimes the people still couldn't get it. So they prophesied of things to come. But Jesus was the one who came because he was the one that was prophesied about. And so therefore, in these last days, we have a more sure word of prophecy because we have Christ himself. And Jesus himself has spoken by his action. He has spoken to reveal all the prophecies of scriptures unto us. And that's why we ought to trust him. So therefore, my brothers, do not despise prophecies because if you do, you are working against God. But, he says, to test them or to prove them. And if they are true, hold fast to that which is good. Is that good principle? So if you reject the voice of the prophets, even those who may not be in written, uh, I mean, who do not have a book in the Bible, you better be careful because if you reject the prophets of God, therefore you are rejecting him. You know, Jesus also said re realistically that, get, guess what? All the blood of the prophets, he would hold the people accountable for. Why? Because they killed many of the prophets. They rejected the voice of the prophets. That's why Jeremiah says here, to hearken unto the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early. But guess what? They did not hearken or they did not heed the voice of the prophets. Today, we are preaching prophecy. We are teaching the world of the second coming of Jesus Christ. What are we doing? We are prophesying. Why? Because we are repeating the words of Christ. And what Christ says is that he will come again. And if he says he will come again, that's a prophecy. And so therefore we are sharing this message with the world and the world is rejecting the message of the prophets because Jesus is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus is greater than Elijah. Jesus is greater than Moses. Do we need Moses? Yes, but this old folks there, the Pharisees, were so entrenched in Moses and the prophets that they missed the true prophet, the ultimate prophet, the prophets of prophets. Jesus Christ is God revealed unto man. He also said, remember this on the walk to Emmaus, he says what? Oh, foolish. <laughs> he said, Jesus called his own disciples foolish. Oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe in all that what? The prophets have spoken. Here Jesus is what? Elevating the words of the prophets. And beginning now, here we go, Moses, the big dog. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained or expounded to them the scriptures concerning whom? Himself. Because the scriptures prophesied of a coming Messiah. Verse 44, then he said unto them, these are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written where? In the law in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Concerning whom? Himself. Acts chapter 10, again, this is New Testament. This is not Old Testament. To him, 
all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will have forgiveness of sins. This is what it's all about. That's why Jesus is the supreme that is mentioned in Hebrews 1. The writer is trying to get us to realize that, yes, God has spoken in this way. God, even in chapter 2, he says he's using the angels to speak his word. But that is why he says, if you reject so great a salvation, because salvation came through Christ. Christ came to demonstrate it in person. So for you to reject it, it is better that you have not even been born. Why? Because you have not only rejected now the prophets, you are rejecting God himself whom his son revealed. That is, as it were, high treason. My brothers and sisters, it is absolutely clear that you and I today need to yoke ourselves up with Christ so fully that his spirit will give us, because discernment is one of the um, gifts of the spirit as well. He will give us discernment, Sister Barbara, to understand, young people, the difference between truth and error. If you say you reject and neglect the Bible, it's, you will be deceived. Plain and simple. If you don't know the word of God, you will be deceived. How can you judge spiritual things without having the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, which is Jesus in flesh? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Peter says, the word of God endures forever. And if we don't want to take this word as our sure guide in the last days, even some of us can be deceived. So what is your decision today? Prove the prophets. Test them. Don't accept everything you see on TV. That is one of the biggest medium of deception today. Because everybody is glued to it. It's very easy to deceive us. But if you stay close to the Bible and you stay close to Jesus, his spirit in you, let something is just not right. Your superhero antenna will be going off. Right? You thought, about the, those are not the superheroes. God is the superhero. Jesus is the greatest hero of all time. Came into this world to save sinners. You and I, we are the chiefest of all sinners. That's what the prophets were trying to say. All the types and shadows, the sanctuary, it was all about Christ. Moses said, another prophet will arise. This is the one you must listen to. Moses prophesied about Jesus. And Jesus came and he gave us his word. He explained it himself. There is no need for us to wonder, what do I need to do to be saved or for spiritual blessings? No. God's word has the answer to what you're looking for. You don't need to call up psychic and go on Dr. Phil and all of these people. Yes, they might help, but the reality is what kind of help are they giving you when you're turning your back away from God and the source of all truth? You're looking for truth? My word is truth. I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. How can you say, I don't know what truth is? There's only one way. You're not looking into truth. By beholding, we become transformed. I want transformation. Let me go to a Tony Robbins seminar. Let me listen to Zig Ziglar and Les Brown. Those are helpful. I listen to them sometimes when I need a little. But here's the thing. The word of God transforms us. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. With what? With the word of God. With the word of God. It's so simple, but it's hard for us because we don't like simplicity. My brothers and sisters, today I'm asking you to make a commitment in your heart that you will follow the Bible and the Bible only that you will keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Are we there? Can you make that commitment in your heart today? And if by chance 
you have a, a, a situation that you're trying to figure out, it doesn't make sense, whether it is in your finances, your health, uh, your relationships, whatever it may be, I'll be willing, but I'm telling you, you can go here. The Bible addresses all of these things. The Bible. Your, your Boaz is here. Your Ruth is here. Everything that you need, I'm telling you, even the simple things, they're here. God speaks today many ways. Go to him. If you are perplexed about anything, ask him, God, please, show me. Reveal it to me. Give me insights. Use someone. Give me the verse. Point me to the right direction. At least 12 ways. I know they're not limited, but at least 12. Say, God, in one of these ways, show me your will. And then give me the heart to obey. Because sometimes we know, but we don't want to walk in it. Why? Because it looks different than what we're expecting. Let us pray. This morning, I want you, again, it's just a simple decision. I want you to ask God to reveal to you the solution to whatever it is might be right now in your life, in your heart, that you are going through. Ask him for the revelation, the answer. Secondarily, secondarily, renew your commitment to be more a student of the Bible and to be closer to Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise because you have not left us as wayward children without direction. Your word declares that you will instruct us and teach us in the way that we should go. Yes, Lord, many times we cannot understand or we seem to be all fucked up about what we should do. You know, and so we are asking you today to still and hush the noise around us that we can hear your voice clearly and understand your revelation to us. Those today who are experiencing some difficulty in their minds, um, they need a solution for their relationship or finances or health or whatever. Those who need direction, God, what career to take or what path to take, uh, give them the wisdom that they need because your word is wisdom. Reveal to them in a sure way that they will not be confused if it's the devil or not. So reveal it in a clear manner that they may know certainly that today you still speak. And Father, may your word sink deep in the crevices of our hearts that we will know your voice from the enemy's voice, that we will be able to discern truth and error, that we will not be deceived in these last days, nor will we be a conduit to deceive others as well. Bless this church planted firmly upon the rock of your word, the rock of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we ask and pray these things. Amen and amen. May God richly bless you, my brothers and sisters.